Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it's uh, good to see so many of you here. Uh, and thank you for the, the overview of one's life flashing before your eyes. It's always a bit depressing, really. But uh, uh, when I was uh, asked to go to, to Riyadh, you know, my first uh, response when I talked to my wife was, no way. You know, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it, it's really been a wonderful uh, posting. I've been there for nearly two years. Uh, it's a fascinating part of the world, and uh, it's always interesting times in the Middle East, but uh, it's, uh, it really is very interesting at the moment. And I think the benefits of covering not just Saudi Arabia, but Oman and Bahrain and Yemen in particular, where I was a couple of weeks ago, um, gives a, a regional perspective, and, um, and, and you get a feel for the, the interplay of relations between those countries. And I also cover the uh, Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which is uh, 57 uh, countries. It's the second largest multilateral organization after the United Nations, and also the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. So that sort of gives it a, 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 a really fascinating uh, uh, balance and, uh, of, of different <coughs> organizations and, and issues. So I also deal with the Rakhine, the OIC is very interesting, what's going on in the Rakhine state, for instance, in Myanmar. And anyway. Um, what I thought I'd do today is uh, look at um, some, comments, some brief comments on, on the economic and trade issues, um, and I could, I could touch on some domestic, um, regional political ones towards the end as well, um, and then, then, then open up for questions. Um, some of you, uh, I know there are people who've recently been, been out there, Robert, uh, uh, what is it here? Yeah, yeah. Yes. it's just come back, so... It, if, he, if I, uh, I might call on him to make some comments if, if I run out of things to say, to <laughs> keep him awake. <laughs> um, and uh, you see, it's also, you just come back uh, from promoting dairy in, uh, in, in Saudi. Um, as most of you would know, uh, the, the, the kingdom is the largest um, economic, economic market in the Middle East. Um, its GDP is 700 plus billion dollars in 2012, which is more than twice that of the UAE, which is the second largest market in the, uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, and it's the only member in the Middle East, North Africa, that's in the G20. Um, admittedly, we're trying to encourage it to do more in the G20, um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, and especially as we, we lead up to Brisbane in 2014, so that's going to be an area we're working closely with them. The economic uh, growth there is quite, quite remarkable, just under 7%. Um, it'll drop a little bit next year to about four and four and a half, five percent. Uh, it has 260 plus billion dollars barrels uh, of oil, um, and with uh, proven barrels of oil, um, which will last at least for 100 years. It's the fourth largest gas um, uh, reserves. Uh, so financially, it's pretty doing pretty well. Um, uh, the surplus this year is expected to be 50 billion dollars, which I think. Uh, a number of uh, people in, in this country would blanch if they, uh, they could only have some of that as a surplus. Um, their reserves are the third largest in the world after China and Japan at about $680 billion. So they're cashed up and uh, they're very serious about uh, development uh, in a big way. They've got a population of 28 million. They are not the largest population by po a country in, in the GCC by population, that's, that's Yemen. Because if you take away the eight or nine million expatriate workers in Saudi Arabia, their population is about 19 million people, whereas in Yemen it's about 24 <coughs> million. And uh, uh, that, that's something that also worries the, 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 the Saudis, in, 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 as you can understand. Um, so the, the, uh, this population is growing about a million uh, people every year, and 60% of them are under 30, and I think uh, it's... Uh, 30% over 15. I mean, it's uh, really a very, very young population. And their GDP per capita is about $25,000. But of course, that masks uh, uh, some very high uh, salary, uh, uh, wages and, and re uh, salaries, uh, uh, as well as some enormous wealth. But there are, there are pockets of poverty. Uh, uh, I only have to cycle on the Friday morning when most Saudis are asleep, uh, down about 15 minutes from where our embassy is, and, and you see people kids running around in bare feet in really poor areas. So it's not uh, all, all, all glitzy by any means. Um, the Saudis are investing very heavily in their development. Um, 
they have a development plan for 2010-2014 that involved $380 billion worth of investment, which they added another $130 billion to. Um, and that's partly to create jobs for that 300,000 new entrants into the labor force. And uh, trying to find jobs for 300,000 new entrants is very difficult. <coughs> now, um, one of the things that the, the King Abdullah, uh, who's been in power since 2005 as king, although he was ruling as the crown prince very much for about a decade before that, he's focused very much on education, and many of you in this room uh, are aware of that. Um, <coughs> there's some... The Ministry of Education was, and the curriculum was, was built and uh, designed very much by conservatives and uh, uh, Islamist conservatives. And uh, I think um, King Abdullah uh, decided, uh, as well as trying to reform the curriculum domestically, he needed a shortcut. And um, the, the overseas scholarship program is not just an educational uh, tool, but I think it's a social transformation tool as well. And this will have enormous impact for the future of Saudi Arabia. At the moment, there are about 150,000 scholarships annually for the King Abdullah Scholarship Program. This is a huge number of young people. And it's not just them that they send overseas, it's their families as well. So in, in Australia, we have, we, we, we're benefiting from that. Um, domestically, 10 years ago, they had seven universities in Saudi Arabia. Now they have 27. And uh, they're building, at the moment, 130 hospitals. Uh, and another 17 more are under construction. So there's an enormous amount of money <coughs> going into building um, infrastructure uh, in, the, in, a social, in the social side. They've also decided they want a financial city. So sort of $50 billion are going to build 60 great big towers around uh, in, in one area in Riyadh to build a financial city in order to try and attract some of the financial expertise from the region into Saudi. Now there's some, uh, the Economist had an article on that recently that uh, wasn't that optimistic about its uh, ability to attract some of the, uh, um, uh, the in interested investors from, from other regional countries, but uh, the Saudis are certainly confident that uh, they will make it worth their while. And uh, there are some uh, speculation that's, well, if you want to do business here, uh, this is where we want you to have your office. Um, Structural problems abound. 90% uh, of the private sector uh, are expatriates, and 90% of the public sector are Saudis. Saudis don't really want to work in the private sector. The salaries aren't there, and you have to have long hours or longer hours. Um, and the public sector is, uh, like in many countries, uh, seen as, as uh, much the preference. But um, uh, the Saudi government is aware of this, and they're taking steps to try and increase the um, attractiveness of the private sector uh, by um, also forcing the private sector to employ more Saudis and they have a NITA card system and you can be asked <coughs> there's a traffic light system with red, orange and green depending on whether you meet the criteria of 30% of your staff have to be Saudis. If you've met that criteria you're in the green and you can get visas for <coughs> foreign staff. If you haven't met that criteria and you're in the red they won't give you visas and they'll, they'll um, uh, make you get rid of expatriate staff. <coughs> so there's a lot of focus on getting Saudis employed. They've also put, uh, I think, $600 a year if you want to bring an expatriate labor in. You, um, you have to pay a $600 so, a, a fee, uh, basically because the, the, um, the, the rents of the salaries are much lower for expatriates. So um, it, it makes it very difficult to employ Saudis. But if you talk to Saudis, they will say, oh, Saudi laborers or Saudi workers, you know, uh, one say, oh, I have one employee, he's lost his grandmother three times, you know, and had funerals. <laughs> so they get very frustrated um, at that. And so there, uh, there is this issue of, of work and culture and work ethic that, uh, that the private sector, and these are Saudi private sectors, um, people um, want to develop in, in, in in the young Saudis, and that's partly why they're sending the Saudis overseas, is to see, well, this is how you have to operate in, 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 the, um, in the developed world, um, and if you want to be competitive. And as some of you who've done business in Saudi Arabia, some of the larger companies have got world-class Saudi managers, uh, they could, and, uh, and also that reflects, too, <coughs> the quality of the ministers, some of whom have been in their jobs for uh, several years, uh, if we don't. Uh, 
um, have such a turnover in Saudi Arabia as we do in some, some other countries of ministers, although there have been some changes recently. So that's just a, a quick snapshot on, on, on Saudi Arabia. And uh, what I'd just shift to now is, is um, uh, how we're perceived and what, um, uh, what the relationship is between Australia and Saudi Arabia. Um, we've got a good brand uh, in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, I think, where if you talk to uh, people about Saudi, uh, Australia, um, there's an increasing recognition mainly because of the uh, uh, students that come over here, but also there's this significant other people-to-people -people activity where we have um, at least uh, 3,000 <coughs> um, uh, Muslim pilgrims a year going to, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia for the, for the, for the pilgrimage. And uh, um, there's this whole people-to-people -people links between different uh, Islamic organizations and Islamic schools. And uh, that, that uh, is, for many Saudis, they're quite surprised about this. Um, uh, but more and more people know about it. Um, the Gold Coast always figures when you talk to Saudis. Uh, when I met the Crown Prince, he thought, oh yes, I went to the Gold Coast uh, 11 years ago or, or 10 years ago, and uh, he remembers it very fondly. Um, many uh, Saudis tend to, to, to like to go to, uh, to the Gold Coast and study there. Um, uh, if you talk a little bit more, they'll, they'll know we have camels. And uh, that's always a good uh, subject of conversation <laughs> until we start to start talking about our live sheep exports. And uh, when we bring up the issue that we're very concerned about how um, our live sheep, our sheep are processed in abattoirs, etc., they'll come and say, "Well, yeah, but you shoot camels." And it's like, "Wow, well, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, an awkward moment." Um, <laughs> uh, because they, they they do love their camels, and but uh, we we. Um, uh, then have long discussions about they're not the same as Saudi camels. That uh, you know, the, the, you go to the camel market in Saudi Arabia, you know, the Saudi Arabia, and the camel would come and put his head on the owner, and he'd just be. I'm saying in Australia, you need six men to tie the down these feral camels. They're not the same, you know. Um, but it's a good point of, of conversation, and it does actually um, lead into a, a broader, which which uh, does uh, help when you talk about infrastructure railways in the desert, mining, um, uh, green buildings, sustainable energy, uh, that it, it leads into a broader discussion uh, out of camels, which is probably a little bit more constructive. Um, uh, but it still it, it, it gets their interest. Um, uh, we have, a, as you probably know, around, there's about 11,000 Saudi students in Australia, um, uh, plus 6,000 um, family members. That brings in at least half a billion dollars a year into, into our economy. In Canberra, at the cultural centre, they employ, the Saudi cultural centre employs 135 plus Australians to help run the, the, the Saudi scholarship program. When the scholars come over, <coughs> um, uh, they come over from an environment where they're used to being looked after and everything is done for them. And that is the same here. The, the cultural attaché uh, office there their role is to make sure the Saudi students have everything from accommodation. If they need to see a doctor, they will organize it. It's very much a, we look after you. Um, it's a travel agent kind of relationship. And so many universities are dealing with, rather with the student directly, they have to deal with the, the, the cultural um, uh, office. And that is because, uh, one, there's expectations there, but I think for the most Saudi ambassadors, the thing they fear most is their students complaining to Riyadh about they're not being looked after well enough because this is the king's program. And uh, the king many times says how important this is to him. So Saudi ambassadors can't do enough to make sure that their uh, high maintenance uh, students are maintained as much as they can, which of course reflects, especially on the universities here that have to, to try and uh, manage that. So there are high expectations. Um, the trade with Saudi Arabia has dropped off over the last few years, particularly in live sheep. It's the, the total two-way trade is about $2.2 .2 billion. But a lot of the trade that's going to the UAE, is at, which is greater, I think it's in the $3.5 or $3.8 billion, a lot of that is destined for Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, we're not a big player in, 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 in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Europeans, the Americans, um, uh, have had long history. They've also got uh, quite significant economic problems, and so in their own countries, so they're really focusing on the Middle East and Saudi in particular, 
especially in the last few years. They've been very aggressive from universities uh, and, and other companies going into Saudi trying to get those big contracts. And they're helped by the fact that, uh, as those of you who visited Saudi know, that personal links are really very important. So the Spanish king will pick up the phone to the king <coughs> in Saudi Arabia and say, this is really good uh, rail contract coming up. Um, we've got the Spanish company there. We hope you give it uh, due consideration. Uh, uh, Francois Hollande will come out. Cameron will come out. Prince Andrew, um, even the, the Chinese premier, uh, uh, premiers just visited the Japanese prime minister. Uh, the Turks have last year, I think, 40 plus ministerial visits. Um, we, we don't, we know we had two last year, and uh, we just can't compete on that level or that level of access. So we're not going to be the top players in Saudi, nor, 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 <coughs> nor can we aim to be. But having said that, I think there is uh, a lot of opportunity, as, as many of you in this room know, for, for those niche players that are going into subprimes. Um, uh, the, the, uh, once you've got that relationship with Saudi, and it takes time, um, then I think that opens doors to, to, other, uh, uh, to other opportunities. Now, um, we have had our, our Foreign Minister uh, Bob Carr visited and also um, the Minister of Agriculture Ludwig has also visited. And, um, but we've also had some useful state visits, um, uh, including from Victoria. And the state visits, we sort of have to fudge it a little bit because they don't quite understand where the state fits in. But, you know, if you've got a, prem a governor or a pri premier, it's, it, it, you know, it, it sort of has some resonance. And uh, <coughs> we, sort of event we eventually sort of say, well, it's a bit like the Emirates. You know, we've got seven Emirates. And, you know, <laughs> ah, okay, you know. So they, they can understand it from, from, from that way. Um, the top, actually, exports from Australia last year was vehicles um, uh, at $800 million. So the Camry and uh, uh, is still, I think, the largest uh, uh, ex export market in, is in Saudi Arabia for the Camry. And the, the Saudis will say, oh, yes, the Camry is a good car. If it's made in Australia, it's good. And they, they do differentiate between Camrys made in Australia and made elsewhere. Um, OK, so looking ahead, uh, Saudi Arabia is becoming increasingly <coughs> active regionally. Um, it's, it's one of the few stable countries there. Uh, since the demise of Egypt, and in the sense of being the leader of the Arab world and focus more on domestic issues, Saudi Arabia is taking a much more assertive role in regional politics. Um, it's well placed financially. It's got those $680 billion of reserves, so it's uh, uh, stocked up and it's, it, it's got a, a, a you know, healthy treasury to, uh, to back itself. Um, it, but it, it, it has significant challenges. And the interesting thing is, is that most of the Saudi ministers you talk to are fully aware of these challenges. They have no illusions. Um, they need to diversify, and they're working very hard to go um, uh, uh, in their plastics and, and oil-related market. They're, they've got this huge uh, plastics and uh, uh, other derivatives of, of oil uh, going, and it's very successful. They also realize that uh, out of that nine or 10 million barrels <coughs> a day that they produce, that they are using at least 20% of that <coughs> domestically for electricity, and that this is unsustainable because there are estimates within 15 to 20 years they'll be using all their oil exports domestically, which would be a, um, uh, not very good for their economy. So uh, they are having to look at taking away subsidies. Uh, at the moment, oil is 12 cents a litre. Uh, water is more expensive than oil. Um, but also uh, uh, renewables. Um, there are plans to build 20 power st uh, nuclear power stations. Uh, they've got agreements with five or six countries to do that, but none has started. Um, but the Minister of Oil <coughs> and uh, Minister of Economy and Planning are very keen on renewables and solar, and that's again something that we've had some discussions with them on, and, uh, including green buildings, etc., because they, their building codes are just now being developed, and they're very interested in, in, what, in what we do. Um, uh, there are, of course, the shale oil discoveries in the U.S. has uh, had quite a, a shock uh, in some circles in Saudi, because the Saudis are worried this will change the nature of the relationship with the United States. Um, some of the more senior Saudis I've talked to are less uh, worried about it, saying, well, 
when that shale oil is developed uh, and processed in the U.S. It's, in, it's processed in factories or, or, or in plants that we own anyway, so we're going to, we're going to benefit from that. Um, and it's a different kind of, uh, uh, it's light or heavy, and they, it's, it's, it's still, they, they, don't, they think they're going to still be um, buying oil from the United States. And on, on the United States side, they still reassure the Saudis, look, um, we're going to be very interested in that region um, for a um, number of reasons, regardless of whether we're buying lots of oil from you or not. So they're trying to reassure them. But it's certainly uh, uh, up for much discussion at the moment. The other big uh, challenge they have is food security. The sort of social contract between the Saudi uh, royal family and the kingdom is we'll provide you, we look after you, we'll you know, provide you with food, we'll provide you with education, with mm -hmm. health, etc., and good quality, cheap food. Um, so th that's subsidized. <coughs> um, but uh, if, the, if, there's, if, if, there are, if the food, when the prices go up, there is invariably uh, reactions on the street. And uh, one minister told me, you know, if we, if we let the, mar the, the free market uh, operate here, they'll throw me out. You know, they, they just, they're, it's part of that social contract that the Saudi government has to provide uh, good quality and cheap food. And so there's pressure on the Saudi government for, for food security. And so they're looking to Australia, uh, not just in live sheep, uh, <coughs> but uh, our frozen beef is, uh, and, and chilled beef market is, is really taken off in the last year. Uh, and dairy as well. Um, uh, they're a very great interest in our, our, our dairy. And again, so that, that has some relevance for, for Victoria. Um, other interesting issues, succession. The king is, is, is uh, in his late 80s, early 90s. Um, I don't think that this is going to be, uh, I think they'll take it in their stride. I don't think there'll be any great uh, earthquake politically there. They're used to this kind of succession. They've got a crown prince in place and <coughs> deputy, so I think that will uh, work fairly smoothly. One of the really interesting strategic issues, I think, is the whole role of women. I mean, that is changing very, very quickly. The king has appointed 20% of the parliament, uh, the uh, appointed parliament, not elected, um, mm -hmm. to the Shura Council. Uh, and this one-fifth of women, and, and uh, they thought they were going to be set, set aside and barriers, but they're, so they're sort of, they are together, but they're in the, the same seating areas. The men, they don't, some of them are not wearing the niqab, just wearing the veil, and they can discuss um, raise issues as everyone else, and so there is a, a women also um, being encouraged to work uh, more and more. Um, that is going to be, I think, a, a significant change and uh, a, a very good one. Uh, but that's not without opposition in Saudi Arabia. It's still a very, very conservative uh, country. And when the king announced this, and having <coughs> said it, uh, he made sure he said, "I've discussed this with uh, uh, religious scholars, and we agree that." It is good. It is fine to have one fifth of the women in the one, one fifth of the members of the Shura Council being women. There was a, a, a demonstration outside his palace of about 50 clerics against that, saying that it was a, a dangerous decision. I mean, it's to go up against the king like that. You, know, you, you rarely, if ever, see in Saudi Arabia. But that does underline it's still a very conservative country. Um, okay, just to, uh, uh, some. Opportunities. Uh, I've mentioned it's uh, a niche. There are niche opportunities. The big question really is where does the Middle East and Saudi Arabia sit in light of the Australian Asia Pacific century? And um, uh, to me, I, I think the, uh, the answer would be it's a hedge. You know, um, we've got established links in uh, the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Asia Pacific is going to be front and four in our, in our trade relations and our strategic interests, but we still have strategic interests in, in the Middle East. In the last 120, 110 years, I think Australian forces have fought six wars overseas, <coughs> four of them have been in the Middle East. And uh, where, even if it may not be our prime interest, it's certainly in our allies' interest and we end up there one way or another. So it, it behooves us to keep good relations there strategically, but also economically. There are a lot of opportunities there. They're looking to us in agriculture, they're looking to us in uh, resources, they're looking to us in uh, uh, services, the knowledge-based economy, and in education. Opportunity to keep those links open um, is, is, would be, as, as a trader would say, a natural hedge. 
Um, uh, tourism, they're more and more interested in coming here. There's now 130 flights a week between uh, the Gulf and Australia, compared to about 70 or 80 for the United States. It's quite significant. Um, uh, we've got established links here. We've got the Council of Australia Arab Relations, and um, uh, some of you uh, being involved in that. We've got the uh, Australia Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and we've got the recently formed uh, joint, uh, the Saudi Australia Joint Business Council, and that uh, um, I think will be a, a very useful tool to to build on on links, particularly <coughs> in uh, between uh, uh, on, on the trade side. Um, finally. If you're going to uh, uh, work in Saudi Arabia, as you know, you need to build trust on a personal level. It's the sort of four Ps. Firstly, it's personal. You need to build that, that trust. Secondly, um, you need patience. And the, most of you who've dealt in with Saudi uh, understand that. Um, you need to be persistent, and you need to have a presence. Um, if you say, and, uh, and we really discourage people from saying, oh, look, we really think Saudi Arabia is important, and we have an office in Dubai, and I come and visit regularly. It's like Saudi Arabia coming here saying, we really think Australia is important, so I've set up a head office in Dunedin, and I'm really going to take <laughs> you seriously. It, it, it's better to say you're with them from, uh, uh, from, from Australia. Um, I think that I'll, I'll leave those sort of comment, open comments there and then throw the floor open to, uh, to questions on any of those issues. So thank you.